everyone in the Thames Valley Church of Christ. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Simon Dunning. I'm currently leading the Belfast Church of Christ. Um, I suspect some of you may also have heard of um, that Bible guy, which is the other uh, ministry and teaching ministry that I cover online as well. You can check that out on, on YouTube. Uh, I'll not plug myself anymore, but it's a pleasure to speak to you today. And what I wanted to talk to you about, oftentimes what we do is we try to teach about things that are current and in the news. Well, today is no exception. Uh, today's lesson is going to be called God is Sovereign. Uh, and you can guess where I'm going and you can kind of realize where I'm getting my theme from. It is indeed going to be the coronation of King Charles III. I'm recording this on Thursday, so that be next week uh, and the ceremony takes place in Westminster Abbey and it's going to be a, an unchanged ceremony which is basically not changed for about a thousand years. It's going to be a ma- His Majesty the, the King and Her Majesty the Queen Consort. Uh, that'll be taking place next week. Um, but it's a formal investiture of a monarch with the regal powers is the way looking this up. That's kind of what it said. A celebratory, a celebratory event where they're presented with royal royal ceremonial objects, such as the crown jewels and the crown on the head and so on. And as I say, this is the first ceremony we'll have seen or heard of, really, since 1953. Queen Elizabeth II, that was the last coronation that we had. So it was a long, long time, not something we're familiar with. But the king will become the head of state. And in the UK, UK, I was looking this up, it's actually a constitutional monarchy, which basically means that the king himself doesn't have the powers to make and pass legislation uh, that's going to be belong to the Parliament. However, they do open Parliament every year, and the bills that are that do go through Parliament need to have a royal assent from the King in order to become an active Parliament. So that's with a constitutional monarchy. I was looking some of this stuff up. wasn't very familiar with some of this stuff, but it is very interesting. And what was very interesting to hear and read about was that the monarchy or the monarch has got a few unique privileges. These are very strange and unusual. Um, there's a couple of ones that sound kind of handy if you were to lose the, these things. He doesn't need a passport, so the king will not need a passport to travel. Not sure he might have needed one before, but he certainly doesn't now. And he doesn't need to drive a driving license. Doesn't need a driving license. That could cause some concern if we remember other royals in the past who maybe um, driving wasn't getting easy as they got older. But he doesn't need a driving license. And then there's a very strange one that he's got this uh, par, power. I understand what I say there. But he retains the right, so the monarch retains the right to claim ownership of any unmarked mute swan. So mute swans, a type of swan, the quieter swans. He's got the right to claim ownership of any unmarked mute, mute swan swimming in open waters. He's got the right to claim it as his own. But he also has the right and got dominion over any whales, sturgeons or dolphins in waters around England and Wales. That's not politicians sturgeons but sturgeons is a type of fish so he's got the rights over these um the whales sturgeons dolphins and they're on the uk waters he can lay claims to them uh doesn't need a passport doesn't need a driving license so there's a few perks for the king uh, that he can look forward to but as i said what i wanted to do today was talk about this in relevance to us in reference to us as christians you're watching this today because you're a christian or you're studying the bible and that is fantastic but we recognize that we've already got someone on the throne, a sovereign that we look up to, that we ultimately worship, that we put them on the throne. They're enthroned on the on the throne for us. And that obviously is God is our king. God is our sovereign. And we'll maybe recall that as we watch the ceremony next week. But if we look in Psalm 47, we will see the, the imagery that the Bible provides us with to help us to see that God is indeed our sovereign. So Psalm 47 tells us, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. He is seated on his holy throne. Listen to the imagery. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of the God of Abraham, for the king of the earth belong to God. The kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. He's on his throne. He resides. He's reigning in power. He's he is described as the king and the king of kings of the earth. God is our sovereign. And this is the imagery the Bible provides to help remind us and show us that God is the one enthroned. How does God want to be known? 
It says here he's sovereign. He is our king. He is the majesty on high. On high. Does God, how does God want us to see him? That's an important question to ask as I look at God as sovereign today. Does God want us to see him like we're going to see King Charles? I was about to say Prince Charles there. We'll have to get used to the change. I'm sure we've already made that change. How does God want to be known? Well, how has God revealed himself in Scripture will be an important way, thing, thing to look at and think about. How has he revealed himself in Scripture? Well, he revealed himself to the patriarchs in the Old Testament as God Almighty, God Most High. Almighty, Most High, so it's like an elevated thing. He's way above anything else, the universe, kings, rulers, those in authority. To Moses in Exodus 3, 13 to 14, Moses was sent to go and free the people from Egypt to speak to Pharaoh. And Moses said to God, well, who should I say will have sent me? And God says, tell them, I am who I am. Sounds pretty confusing, right? I am who I am. God was setting himself up as the self-created one. The one who's always been, always has been, always will be the almighty over everything, over time. No, he's a self-existent one, as I should have said. The self-existent one. It's kind of what this phrase means, Yahweh, the self-existent one. And this is the way God revealed himself to Moses. Is that I want you to think about me and describe me on these terms. And these terms are completely unique. We cannot use these of the king to come or anyone else of, or in this universe. Only God. And that's what God wanted. He's separated. He's the almighty. He's the one enthroned. God was the one that brought the nation out of e the Israelites out of Egypt and his purpose was to reveal himself to them as the king. And we see this in the Song of Moses at the Exodus 15, verse 18 here. The Song of Moses, when the people had got out of Egypt, Moses sung this song and the people would have joined in. And just watch how it finishes in terms of the people's viewpoint about the God who had rescued them from, from slavery and led them into the promised land. Not got there yet, of course. And it says in verse 18, the Lord reigns forever and ever. And you can read the rest of that song of Moses and Miriam and how elevated and lofty view the people had of, of God Almighty, Yahweh, the I am who I am, the self-existent one. But it said the Lord reigns forever and ever. The whole idea of this song was the idea that the Lord is the one that reigns. And we're going to look at what that means now and what that looks like and how God has showed that. But that's in Exodus 15. Now, if you look into the Old Testament, you'll see that there's a word that's used. And you'll notice it's even in Psalm 47 if you look up the Hebrew interlinear and you notice the comparison of the Hebrew versus the English. The word that's used in the Old Testament is melech. Melech, you'll see it in Psalm 47 there. This word melech means the, the king, essentially the king, the sovereign one, the, the one who reigns. Um, he was to exercise his function as a monarch. This is the meaning of this word. Sometimes it's used of a human king, but it means you exercise your function as a monarch. You're the one that reigns. You're ultimately the king. The word for king is melech. And it's the most common Old Testament word for a chief magistrate, for a ruler. Uh, and as I said, translates as king, lord, captain, ruler, prince, or chief. So there's all these terms that he uses to, to, to describe the one who's reigning, the one who's in charge, the one who has all power in this case. Sometimes a shepherd is described in this way also, and it's used figuratively for a king in the Old Testament. So sometimes you'll notice um, the shepherd is described as the king in the Old Testament, as in the shepherd is the ruler. Everyone is to follow the shepherd. Everyone is to bow to the shepherd. And in that sense, the people are described as sheep. But this word melech is the word used in the Old Testament to describe God, the only ruler, the king above all kings, the one enthroned, the one who reigns. So Israel in the Old Testament, were to see God as the king. How do we know this then? How else can we know that God wanted the people of the Old Testament and us today through Jesus to view him as the king? What other signs and imagery and terminology and stories in the Old Testament can we hear or read that describe this idea that God wanted the people to see him as a king? Well, two things today to look at which show this really, really well. The first one, and we'll look at this in a bit more detail now, is the structure of the Old Covenant and the similarities with the suzerain vessel treaties. They'll describe that in a moment. You may have heard about that before, but the similarities. The other reason that we know that God wanted to be seen in this way, the enthroned king, was the idea of what the people were to bring with them, the ark and the tabernacle. The ark and the tabernacle in the wilderness. The ark was like the throne of God to be present among the people, and the tabernacle was like the royal tent. And what did God tell him about the ark and the tabernacle? You're to keep this in the midst of you. 
It'll be in your midst, ever, ever, ever present, like God has enthroned this king. So these were the imagery that we see. Well, the first thing, as I mentioned there, was the suzerain vassal treaty. And this was a symbol of God's kingship. So such a covenant, um, the lesser king, the vassal king, was made to make peace with the great king of a region, the suzerain, of which our word sovereign comes from. Suzerain means above, means sovereign. They were to make peace with the king of the region, the suzerain. The vassal then swore allegiance to the suzerain and then offered tribute. So we give over tribute for that protection. The suzerain was known as the king of kings uh, and they were to swear protection if the vassal was attacked. So the vassal would make a treaty with the suzerain, offer up um, tributes and gifts, and then they would protect them should there be any trouble. Well, this was common in the, the, the Near East at that time, these kind of suzerain vassal treaties. If you're a weaker king, you've got to try and get a more powerful king, the king of kings, to protect you should something take, ha- take place and you're to offer them tribute. So this style of kingship won suzerain over the vassals. This treaty, scholars observed that the covenant given at Mount Sinai, so Exodus 19 given to Moses, um, bears close resemblance to a suzerain vassal treaty, a formal treaty that was signed into by suzerain and, and all the vassals. This covenant at Mount Sinai bear close resemblance. The treaties included elements which also appear in Exodus 19 that you also see these in Deuteronomy when it's laid out in more detail. We have several things that you'll notice in this covenant with God made with Moses that is remarkably similar to that suzerain vassal treaty. First thing is a preamble. The second thing is a historical prologue. The third thing is just general stipulations given to Moses. Then we have specific stipulations and laws and rules. Then we have blessings and curses for either following it or not following what the suzerain or God in this case has asked you to do. And then you have the all-important witnesses. So this is just a layout to show you, and you can look into that in more detail, that this was a sign that God was laying out this treaty, if you like, with Moses and the people, and it was to mirror what they would have known already that vassal kings would sign up to with the king of all the kings to, for protection, and that would be in their mind. This is the same structure and format here that the kings around us would follow. So this is us signing up to the king of kings. The Yahweh covenant was this is Yahweh's covenant that he was going to be their king and also be their protector. And that's the way the people would have understood this giving of the covenant at Mount Sinai. Yahweh was the high king, the great king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. God was displaying through this treaty that that's who he was. And that would be people's understanding of this is who the Lord is. Because some people in the crowd would not really have known other than what their fathers and ancestors would have told them about who God was. And this was how he was revealing himself as the great king. God is the one enthroned. And we see this as we move on in the Old Testament with David and many others when they start to describe God and how God is enthroned. We'll see it in Psalm um, chapter 99. Read it for a minute. One of David's Psalms. In Psalm 99 verses 1 to 5, um, David describes God. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion, he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name, he is holy. The king is mighty, he loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, he is holy. This is David writing about the majesty of God, about how he's enthroned above. This was the understanding the people were to have at Mount Sinai. And later on, they were to understand this is the way God operates with man. He's declaring himself to be the king, but not just the king, the king of kings, Lord of lords, the one enthroned. And just for your own um, understanding, there's several other scriptures. There are many more than this, but just you can look up Psalm 5 verse 2, 29 verse 10, Psalm 74 verse 12, Psalm 95 verse 3. I'll Message these up as well. Jeremiah 10, verse 10 is an incredible scripture. Zephaniah 3, verse 15. Zechariah 14, verse 9. And 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. So I'll put them up again so you can get access to these scriptures and many, many more which talk about the idea of God is the, is the great king um, over all the earth. There's a problem, however. God is a great king. King Charles, let's hope he's a great king also. But it doesn't mean that your subjects are always loyal to you. It doesn't mean that they all recognize you as king and that they all give you tribute as they should. They don't necessarily see you the way they should see you. And what happens in the Old Testament, so what doesn't happen to King Charles III, is that the people rejected God as king. They wanted to have a human king like all the nations around them. 1 Samuel 8, 
verses 5 to 7. We'll probably know this story pretty well. We don't want you as king God. They didn't say it like that. But we, we want a human king because we want to be like the other nations around us. In other words, we don't fully trust in your ability, God, to lead us because it's not the way it happens around here. The rest of the world is not doing it like that. So the kings Saul and David became the human kings, of course, but they were appointed with an understanding. And the understanding was is that God is the great king. And we see this in Second Chronicles 9, verse 8, the fabulous scripture which reveals what people outside the Israelites understood as the great king. You'll hear this is Queen Sheba talking to Solomon, or what she said about Solomon. Second Chronicles 9, and in verse 8, it says, Queen Sheba said this, Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on his throne as king to rule for the Lord your God. Did you see that Queen Sheba saying about Solomon? You know, he's placed you on his throne to rule for the Lord your God. You may be a human king, but it's only on the premise that God is the great king. He's put you on the throne. So that understanding developed, thankfully, over time. And it was good to hear this said here. Okay, you may have a human king, but they're not the great king. Our God in heaven is enthroned above. He is the great king. So unfortunately, like I said, it's only human nature that we do not always remember this. And I wanted to share this today just to say it's important that we recognize our position. That God has allowed, he had allowed himself to be rejected as king. And as we know, Jesus was also rejected by many. But being humans that we are and this humanity is, it's important that we realize who the true king is. And that we don't forget that God is enthroned. And it's so easy for us to forget. And if we don't worship God as the great king, what do we do? Like those in 1 Samuel here, we end up deposing him and worshiping something else. We will worship something. We will have a king. It just might not always be God. So it's important we recognize our natures and understand this and then worship God acceptably as he is the great king. Because like the Israelites, we can replace him as God. So I want to say today that we are right when and only when we stand in the right position relative to God. Whenever God is his king on a throne in our lives, it will orientate our lives so that they work best for us. And it's important that we don't then adapt God in order to suit us, but that we adapt in order to suit God. It reminds me of that orientation thing, of finding our bearings. I remember where I was away with the school on a holiday, and we were away for a week at the end of first year. I was like 13, and we got separated from the pack. And I would say for about, it felt like about a day, but probably about an hour, we were actually lost, me and another guy. And we kept speaking to people who, who didn't speak any English and we couldn't find our way back. But the one thing that we did have was the name of the hotel. I think I said La Rochelle. I think I've got that from French textbooks. It might have been something else. But we kept asking people um, to, where's this hotel? Where's this hotel? And eventually we found the hotel. Had we not have known the name of that hotel, had we not have found that hotel, I don't know that we would ever have got back. <laughs> But we got back because we had our bearings. Like a, a ship at sea has the compass to navigate, to know where it's going, to find its true north or south or whatever it is. We'll only be orientated when God is in his proper place, when God is on his throne. And then that way, all the other elements of our life will fit better into place. We must locate our bearings. And in order to do that, God needs to be in his rightful, proper position. So the question then today is, what will it look like to have God on his throne? What will this look like for us? It's important that we investigate this, that we think about what it, it doesn't look like when he's not on his throne versus what it will look like when he is on his throne. So the first thing I want to say is a few things to say to us today, things that we can identify that maybe reveal the issue that God may not be on his throne or, or maybe he is right now or maybe we're trying to put him back on his throne where he should be. And a few things just to say to us today, three things to say to us. First one is seeking him for guidance. Whenever someone's on their throne reigning as king, we will seek them for guidance. We'll not be reliant upon our own viewpoint about everything. Whenever we need to do something new, take a new direction, or we're not sure, we will seek them for guidance. And in this case, we will pray as Christians. We will pray as a first priority when we're stuck or unsure of what way to turn. The second thing we'll do is listen to his answers. When the king speaks, the people listen. When God speaks, the people listen. Where do we hear his word? We know it's in the scriptures. And he may speak through the Spirit, he may speak through other people, he may speak through songs and other things as well, but we need to be seeking answers from the King and we need to be listening for those answers. Are we digging into the Word to hear what the King has to say about our lives? The last thing I would say on this is, 
when you think about a particular action or thing you're going to do, the question I would ask, and I think we would ask this question if we were in the presence of the king or in close quarters with the king, we would ask, would this please my king? Would this, in our case, please God? What I'm about to do, the decisions I'm about to make, the thoughts that I'm having, what I'm going to watch, the conversations I would have, how I live my day, the list goes on. Would this please my king? Would this please him? 1 Corinthians 6, 12 tells us everything is, is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Just because I'm allowed to do something doesn't mean it's always the best thing. So just to finish, I want to ask us just three questions to consider today. The first one is, how do we know from the scriptures that God wants us to see him as a king? How do we know from the scriptures or otherwise that God wants us to see him as king? The second thing is, what threats exist for us that could dethrone God in our life. It's good to be self-aware and understand what threats exist for me that could dethrone God in my life. And the last question is, um, when you think about what pleases God, what are we doing now or can we do that would please our sovereign, our great sovereign, our great God? What can we do? What are we doing now? Or what could we be doing now that would please our great God? I do hope some of us has helped us today. We'll be back with a follow-up video as well on a different slant about what it means who we are now because God is in his rightful place as our great king and sovereign. Please let me know your thoughts on this today. It'll be wonderful to be with you all and I'll be back again very soon.